I bet you're wondering how I got here. I would have to take you back to 2007 outside a mock Inca temple in Disney World where I met the most beautiful woman that I had ever seen. And I thought to myself, I'd better marry this one. <laughs> so in true British male style, it took me a year for me to let her know that she was the one. And that was in 2008 in San Diego, where I professed my love. We began to make plans. The physical hurdle, I thought, would be a challenge, but I could get over that. What I didn't consider, what I didn't take into full consideration was the hurdle of cultural difference. I found that as time went by here in the United States, I began to change. I began to metamorphosize, if you like. I became a unicorn. He looks dazed and confused, which is how I feel most of the time. Look at me. Here in America, most people don't expect this accent to come out of this body. And it sounds bad, right, doesn't it? Stereotyping? But is it? We all stereotype. Many Americans think that all Brits have bad teeth. We Brits think that you care about your teeth way too much. <laughs> Many Americans think that British food is terrible. It's some of the best food in the world, believe me. And we in Britain think that Americans have an unnatural love affair with burgers. <laughs> what this basically means is we often find ourselves in a cultural clash. And this can be painful in many circumstances, but it can also afford opportunities. And the following two tales that I'm going to tell expand upon this very theme. Let me take you to Chicago 2011 on a windy, cold, breezy Halloween night. My wife had decided that we should go out to the center of Chicago for a, an evening out. And it was here that I was first introduced to an American Halloween. In Britain, people just get dressed up of ghouls and monsters, but particularly for the women in the United States, it's a time or a space that they can be risque in their deportment, shall we say. To that end, my wife appeared in a rather suggestive maid's outfit, which, much to my chagrin, I've not seen since. <laughs> so, into the Chicago night we sped. And we danced all night, we frequented a number of establishments, and it got to about 1 a.m. in the morning when we decided we were a little hungry, a little peckish, if you will. And the only solution was to go to Harold's Chicken and Waffle, fine purveyor of deep fried chicken everything. So we ordered a taxi and off through the Chicago night we sped. We arrived at Harold's Chicken and Waffle on the south side in an African-American area which was slightly socio-economically depressed. 
often referred to as the hood. Out I stepped, and I thought it was only sensible that my scantily clad wife should remain rather hungry in the car while I sallied forth to go find our deep fried chicken remains. So in to Harold's chicken and waffle, I strolled. And behind a plexiglass was a rather rotund African-American individual with a bushy beard. And I addressed him as follows. Excuse me, my good man. Would it be possible for me to purchase from you four chicken legs, eight chicken wings, a couple of sachets of tomato ketchup, and two bottles of your finest Coca-Cola, please, sir. What was the reply? And I said, me, allow me to reiterate my said order, if you will. Please may I purchase from you four chicken legs, eight chicken wings, a couple of sachets of tomato ketchup, and two bottles of your finest Coca-Cola, please, sir. He stared at me for a second, and then turned round and shuffled off into the back to prepare my order. That allowed me to survey the scene before me. And as I gazed across Harold's chicken and waffle, I spied two burly-looking brothers, if you will. Very large, full bicep, tattooed, and they were staring at me, halfway eating a chicken leg. I was looking at them, they were looking at me. I, as you can see, was dressed as Tuvok, the black Vulcan from the Star Trek Voyager franchise, with a ray gun and pointed ears and a faultless British accent. They stared at me, I stared at them. You could cut the atmosphere with a knife. I might as well have been from the planet Vulcan. <laughs> Luckily for me, there was a suited brother behind who interjected and said, hey, hey man, it's okay. He's from England. They have black folk, uh, black folk out there that talk like that. One of them said, for real? Yeah, for real. At this point, the gentleman from behind the gent uh, plexiglass had returned with my order. And at this point, I interjected, yes, I actually am from England. You guys should pop along. You would love it over there. At this juncture, I turned round and thanked the suited brother behind me for his timely interjection and explanation for my existence. I thought it only timely to now leave Harold's chicken and waffle. I went back to hand the chicken to my rather hungry wife. And just before I got into the taxi, I looked over my shoulder one last time to see the two brothers sat at the table slowly gesticulating their chicken, still watching me get into the car, still not believing what they had seen with their own two eyes. A man with a, a British accent ordering chicken at 1 a.m. in the morning. What does this mean? In some ways, a cultural insider, the suited brother, was needed to explain my existence. And this is painful. Because it means, in a sense, as a black man, I will never be fully accepted 
in American society. It means that cultural difference in this regard is painful. It's something I have to get used to. Change is my watchword. Which leads me to my second story. When I first arrived in the US, one of the first accounting exams that I gave, I addressed the class as following. I had a class of about 40 students. And I addressed them. I said, in front of you, you have answer sheets. In front of you, you have question sheets. You should all have pencils. And you should all have pencil sharpeners as well, should you need them. I have some rubbers on my desk, should you require or need them, a pile of them. Just come up and grab them if you need. Of course, in America, we refer to condoms as rubbers. In Britain, we refer to erasers as rubbers. Cultural difference strikes again. So, as you can imagine, I couldn't actually give the test. A number of my students were bent over double with laughter. So, I had to give the test the next day. And I did manage to successfully do that. And later on, back at our apartment that evening, I was grading around 35 of the papers of the 40 students I had. I had graded 35 papers. And my wife passed me and inquired, why exactly was I giving an E grade on some of the scripts? And I said to her, well, you know, a number of these scripts aren't quite worth a D grade, but neither are they worth a fail grade of an F. So the only sensible grade I could give was an E grade. She then informed me that in the US grading rubric, an E grade doesn't exist. Worse still, should I continue giving my students an E grade, they may think I have given them an E for effort, which is not what I was driving for. As you can see, cultural difference is something that I have to deal with all the time. And it can be painful. But it can also be beneficial. Although people ask me about my accent all the time, it can work for me. Only recently, I had a wonderful experience at the DMV, the Department of Motor Vehicles. I had to change some details with my license. I was in and out in 15 minutes. Why? Because the lady behind the counter was a huge Downton Abbey fan. <laughs> Job done. But you know, everything changes. Even unicornness changes. The accent that was so successful in getting to first base with my wife has all but disappeared. She can't hear it anymore. She used to say that I sounded just like the black British actor Idris Elba. But now she just wishes I was Idris. Cheers. And as I look out at the audience, I can see that some of you can see exactly what she's getting at. So, what do I have to leave you with? Change, cultural difference can be painful, but we often grow through pain. Cultural difference can afford us a whole wealth of opportunities. And yet we must be aware of the significance of cultural difference. We must also be aware that culture repositions us. It's made me a unicorn in the United States. But it's also afforded me 
the ability to grow on a personal and professional level. I'm a father, I'm a husband, and I'm a professor. Something I wouldn't have thought possible just six short years ago. And it is difficult being a black British man in America, but the positive experience that I have as a father, as a professor, helped me survive in an environment which is often alien to me. So I would leave you with what we have on this last slide. See how the challenge of being in a new space can positively add to your life. Be the unexpected. Dare to be a unicorn. Thank you very much.